All right, so welcome to how, how to take better travel photos. This is, uh, this is your photo, right, Etienne? Yes, this, this was taken uh, in Vietnam. September last year. Sorry? North, North Vietnam. North Vietnam. This is the tea plantation in North Vietnam taken in September 2018. Okay, excellent. I like the, the people in their hats just kind of leading off uh, and seeing that, that photographer makes me kind of want to stand in the middle of the, the fields there. It's uh, that was an amazing afternoon, amazing afternoon. So uh, first, uh, let me tell you um, about our agenda and details for the workshop. So um, first, I'm going to tell you briefly about uh, who we are, uh, myself and Etienne. Then after, Etienne's going to give us about a 20 minute uh, or maybe a little bit more, 20 to 30 minute uh, travel for his travel photography tip uh, presentation. Then after that, we're going to tell you about the five-day Central Vietnam photography tour that we're running. Also, we're going to um, share a special tour offer we have, which we're launching just um, with this webinar today. And at the end, we're also going to run a Q&A session. It's scheduled to go 15 minutes, but we're happy to stay on uh, longer, I think, if, if people have more questions. Um, one thing I want to tell you about using this um, this webinar here, our join, and when you're joining the webinar, is that if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see this kind of bar, which you see here on my presentation slide. If you don't see that, you can use your mouse and hover over the bottom. And it should look something more or less like this, but you'll see a little chat icon and then a Q&A icon. So if you have something you'd like to chat about, feel free to just type it in the chat uh, box on the side. If you can't see the chat box, if you minimize, uh, if you don't view in full screen mode, you'll be able to see the chat box. But if you're viewing in full screen mode, I don't think you can see it. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please write your um, questions in the Q&A. Just click on that Q&A, type in your question, and I will answer your question while Etienne is talking. Or I might interrupt Etienne if it seems really relevant at the moment and just ask him your question as he's presenting. But if I don't ask him your question while he's presenting, we'll definitely get to it during the Q&A. So if you have a question in the moment, click on that Q&A and type in your question. Please don't type your question in the chat because it's harder for me as people chat, it's harder for me to pull those out towards the end. So let me introduce myself. Um, like I said, my name is Pete DeMarco, and I'm primarily a uh, landscape photographer. I really love to shoot cityscapes, architecture. Um, I use my drone a lot. I love aerial photography. This photo on the left is a photo I took in Dubai with my drone. The photo on the right is one from India. I also like to shoot people as well. I like to have them be part of my scene, kind of like uh, making environmental portraits. I also enjoy that as well. I also do landscape photography. This is Mount Bromo in Indonesia. So I love just being in the outdoors and traveling. Uh, this is one of the highlights for me of, of Asia for landscape photography is Mount Bromo in Indonesia. I was not always a photographer. I came to Asia about 12, 13 years ago. I used to live in South Korea and I taught English at the university there. And while I was teaching, I just fell in love with photography. I did it all the time. And I started submitting my photos to magazines, to photo contests, and I ended up publishing my work. I was right, this is a, a story that I wrote and shot for Philippine uh, Thai Airlines magazine. And then also I travel around Asia leading workshops and tours, and also have um, a course that I um, have on my website about landscape photography. For Etienne, uh, he's a French travel photographer based in Hoi An, Vietnam. I think he's been there over 10 years now, right? 12 years now. 12 years. So we came to Asia probably around the same time. Mm, yeah, probably, yeah. Um, he founded Pics of Asia and Hoi An Photo Tours over 10 years ago, and he leads photographers all around Asia. Sometimes he's in Bangladesh or in... Um, where else do you go? Iran, Iran, Sri Lanka, India, Myanmar, and of course Vietnam. Yes. Um, his company has won the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence for the last five years. His tutorials have been published on top photo sites around the world like 
petapixel, f-stoppers, DPS, and um, Etienne is also a speaker at photo events around Asia. So um, we're really lucky to have him here today to share his knowledge and tips with us. So Etienne, it's all yours. I'll let you take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. So thank you everyone for coming. I think Pete has been doing a, a great introduction to uh, what we're gonna do today. So I wanna do a small presentation about travel photography in general, about some things that can help you to be more efficient in your travel photos. Of course, I think the event will be more interesting once we are interacting to each other at the end with the Q&A session. So please prepare questions. I already see someone ask a question in the Q&A section, a very interesting thing. So what I wanna do now is to do a small presentation to introduce somehow some tips, some, some tools I've been I created over the years to help people cope with the amount of things you need to, to consider when doing people photography because when we travel in Asia and the place is usually a little bit messy and there are a lot of people around and things move very fast. If we don't have tools to help us, uh, we tend to feel very overwhelmed and it's a bit difficult to come up with interesting clean compositions. So to talk about, I'm gonna have three parts in my presentation. First, I wanna talk about some composition tips that some of you may find useful. Uh, I think the most interesting part of this presentation is when we talk about approaching people after uh, over 10 years of, of running photography tools, a lot of Westerners coming on the tour and the thing they find the most difficult is how do you approach people? How do you end up and stick your camera in someone's face and feel good about it? Okay, this is, not an easy part, mostly from a Western point of view. And then we'll talk about Central Vietnam and why Central Vietnam, my home here, uh, is, is great for travel photography. So for that composition first, I'll talk about something that I call templates, okay? Having your templates created, uh, your own templates to help you cope with the situation and be faster with it. But of course, I could not talk about composition without talking about the light. And, Whatever we talk about in composition, whatever rule we talk about and tip we talk about, I cannot stress enough the importance of working with a good light. And Pete will agree with me, it's the same for landscape photography, okay? You have to wake up early, you have to wait for sunset, but it is the same for people photography. So a lot of photos that you see, uh, because a lot of people ask me, I, I put some photos online, I do, I do webinar with people, I do photo review and I show a photo and people ask me, oh, amazing photo, what camera settings did you use? No, what light did I use? This photo is interesting because the light is interesting and only a special light will give you a special picture. So it's something I really talk a lot about a lot during our photography tour. So the goal is to find the light which will give you the more interesting results and only once we find this interesting light, we can start run, turning around a subject. We can start composing around a subject, interacting with a subject, trying to come up with an interesting composition. But if the light is not here yet, we're gonna work very hard, uh, harder than, you know, when the light is beautiful, you just photograph eggplants on a basket and it's beautiful. Okay, so it's just as simple as that. Of course, it will agree with me when the sky is pink and orange, it's prettier than when the sky is white or gray. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, so now talking about templates. Templates is something you build. It's kind of a preconceived composition, well, templates that you use regularly in your composition. So template has to be personal. Right now I'm gonna show you some examples of templates, but you're gonna tell me, oh, but this is, I know that. Okay, my first template is the rule of thirds. So the template, it, rule of third is not a template, rule of third is a, is a basic rule of photography, but this is what I mean. By applying the rule of thirds, the template of the rule of thirds, you're gonna become fast at applying this rule. You're gonna get used to applying the rule of thirds. And when you face a certain situation, you are faster to place your subject on the third, for example. So you don't have to think yourself every single time you see something, let me put my subject on the third. You're gonna think automatically, you're gonna put it on the third. So you're already saving half a second of thinking rule of third, rule of third. And some people tell me there's no rule in composition. Oh, don't teach, you don't teach people about rules, you know, it's about following your instincts and stuff, but you cannot teach your children how to speak without grammar rules, okay? You need to start somewhere, 
Okay, you arrive in Asia, as I said before, it's very overwhelming. You gotta talk to people, or oh, they're gonna ask you for money if you take the picture, or what are you gonna do? Oh, my settings are all wrong, or what I'm, oh, rule of thirds. And, okay, you know, it's very overwhelming. So starting applying slowly these rules, which are called rules of composition, the rule of third, but slowly turning these rules into your own templates, the things that you shoot and the thing that you like to shoot. And these templates should be yours, should be your own, because you like to shoot something that someone else doesn't, for example. So something I personally like to use a lot is what I call, well, this is a bit more advanced rule of thirds. For me, the rule of thirds doesn't mean put your subject on the third. For me, the rule of thirds means put your subject on the third and find something else interesting to put on the other thirds. So the man on the top left corner is painting the boat and the man on the bottom right corner, the hat is coming out. So you bring balance to your picture by trying to put your main element, your main character on the third and balance it with something else on the other third. So it's something I myself always try to do when composing. If I see the lady coming with a boat on the right side, I would wait for the right lady to be on the right side as well. Uh, triangles and shapes, you, it's also another rule of composition, but it's something I myself use a lot. So if I find two interesting elements, I will wait for a third one and I will try to fill my frame with these elements, okay? Because Asia can be very messy, we tend to include a lot of distraction, a lot of trash in the background. Filling your frame is one of the first thing I try to push people to do when doing people's photography. You find something interesting and you wanna rush a little bit too much to get the shot because you worry it's going to go away and you include a lot of trash in your background. So trying to fill the frame and trying to create shapes with the elements we like. So determining that I like the two conical hats in the foreground, I wait for a third thing to happen in the background, creating this triangle that fills my frame. Same for the men on the boats, okay, fixing the boats. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. And, and if you look at my photography a bit, you're gonna say, yeah, you're doing too much of it, Etienne, you should stop. Anyway, what I try to do really is try to layer. I mean, I love, I love shooting silhouettes because, uh, well, why do I love shooting silhouettes? It's as simple as that. I try to find clean backgrounds for my messy situations, okay? Look at the photo on the right side. You've got about 35 people in this frame. Are you gonna come up with a clean photo of that? I think the best way to come up with a clean composition is to come up with a clean background, okay? Where are the cleanest backgrounds around us? Well, one of it is the sky and the other is the ground. You always have the simplest background around you up and down. So shooting towards the sky or shooting up towards the ground will help you to compose more interesting things because your background is simple. Once my background is simple, I can start layer, layering information in front of the background. I will still come up with a simple composition. So that's why I started doing it and it became a bit of a habit and my personal favorite game these days is to try to layer as many people, as many elements as possible uh, facing a simple background. So to tell more interesting stories because one person in front of a nice simple background is a pretty picture, but the story is a little bit limited. So it's something we talk a lot about during the workshop is to try to come up with more interesting, uh, stronger storytelling images than just, you know, a cute kid smiling at the camera. Uh, now, okay, I think time-wise I'm doing okay. Um, so we can talk about more composition tips later in the Q&A. If you have uh, questions, just go ahead. I want to talk about approaching people, okay? This is one of the main challenge uh, people face, mostly Westerners. In, in our Western culture, we don't get close to people like this. We have our private space. You don't get too close to me. I don't know you. you oh, you're getting a bit too close to me. What's going on? You're a little bit of a strange person. What you have to understand is that when you travel to Asia, the culture is different. You cannot compare with the way people do things here with the way you do things with your own culture. So if someone comes to me, a Western person comes to me and say, how dare you get so close to that old lady and take a picture? Then I tell her, how dare you judge what I do on your own culture, on your own cultural point of view? We are in a different place, people act differently. If you spend a little bit of time living or traveling in Asia, you understand that people are very touchy. People are very uh, grabby. They grab you in the street. They get close to you. And after two minutes, they ask you, what's your name? Are you married? You have children? How much money you make per month? 
the, the privacy, the sense of privacy is very different here. So first, that's an element that helps us. Once you understand this dynamic of the culture here, it helps you get close to the people. But I think what I want to talk about now is something that works everywhere around the world, okay? The best thing that works for me in Asia, taking photos of people, is to genuinely show interest into what people do. And to do that in a genuine way, you cannot just think as a photographer, okay? If I'm a photographer, I want to get my shot, I want to get close to the man, I'm going to do as much as possible to get close to him because I want my shot. It's fine, you're going to get your shot, but if you, you're not genuine with your interest. You need to really show interest genuinely you see this man you really want to take photo of this man put your camera down put your camera down and gesture to him gesture to him that what he's doing is something you don't have in your country <gasps> what is this you're doing oh, oh i don't like that put the camera down and go and chat with him you cannot speak with him you don't speak the same language you can point with your fingers you can make him understand that you don't know this is something you want to eat or something to drink or it's something that you're using for fishing or something like that. You find a way to show interest. Once you show interest in people, they really open themselves to you. They know you're the visitor. You're coming from your mostly, I mean, it's you know, st very stereoty stereotypical in Asia. You're the Westerners coming from your rich country, going to see the people here. And the people here see it like this. The people here tell you, oh, you're, you're a rich Westerner. Like they have this idea of Western countries are richer than Eastern countries. So the way people see that, you are the supposedly rich Westerner who comes down and asks them questions about what they do. You show interest in what they do. They have few, people feel very proud, feel very honored to have that. And then they want to show you more. And this is the time they start explaining you and you understand more about what's happening around your subjects. And they start talking to you and you don't understand what they say, but you see them doing, and then they take another piece of what they were doing and they show you, see, when I put this piece together, it does this, and I use this to go fishing. And then you go, okay, this is interesting, but why they were doing this, why they were showing you that? You realize that when they turn their head this way, there's a nice light coming on the head. But when they move their body here, there's a more simple background this way. So by showing interest into people, not only you get to know them more and you end up with better composition, but you also analyze your environment better. And you can understand what can make a more powerful picture. So you can interact with people. This is an example. This lady, I mean, if you go in Hoi An Market, you see this lady. Every morning, she's in the market selling bananas. Every afternoon, she's in a corner of the market selling bananas. And when you see her and you walk towards her, she looks at you like, here's another tourist who's going to take my photo again. Like, she looks at you coming like, another tourist is going to come and take my photo. Okay, like he's gonna come take my photo, not say hello to me. And people, they tend to be, you know, you arrive in a market in a touristic place and you sense people, they look at you coming with a the camera, they get like another tourist. They do that because every single person who took a photo before did not even say hello to her. Okay, you're gonna kneel down next to her and you're gonna say hello. You're gonna say sin chao because you learn five words of the language of the country you travel to. And she's gonna say, oh, you stopped and say hello and you're gonna sit next to her. And you're gonna look at her banana and you're gonna say, there's a good banana. And then she's gonna to try to sell you some. Uh, maybe you spend half a dollar and buy a few bananas. Maybe you don't, you say, oh no, thank you, I'm full. And then you sit next to her. She's thinking, you know, this photographer is a bit different. He's not jumping on me, taking a photo, he's just sitting. And he's curious about me, he's asking me questions. It's pretty cool. And after two minutes sitting with her, a client comes. She's gonna sell banana, she forgets about you. She gets back into doing her natural thing. You're around, you're here, you've been studying the background, you've been chatting with her, she knows you're a nice person and you feel she's okay with you taking a picture. Then you can start taking a picture, then you show her. And when you show her the picture, this is the face she's gonna give you. So you're gonna take a picture feeling, I think if I take a picture, she's not gonna like it. And you take a picture and she's smiling and she's so happy. And then you leave, you leave the interaction and she says, thank you. I mean, once this kind of experience happened, you start realizing, okay, it's actually easy to photograph people. It is all about you. It is all about the way people will perceive you and the way you will approach people. And you can do the same everywhere. You know, uh, Pete, uh, I forgot his name, the photographer who shot Humans of New York. Oh. Um... You know, the guy walks in the street in New York and he's like, hey, hello, I'm a photographer. I'd like to take your picture for a book, etc." Well. Will someone in the chat will, will tell us his name, yeah. maybe? This is exactly the same thing. Hello, old lady. I'm a tourist. Oh, I've never seen a banana in my life before. What is it? Can I eat it? 
And anyway, you know, you know what's a, what a banana is, but you show interest. And I'm a tourist. I got a camera in my hand. I've never seen banana before. I want to take a picture of that banana. Oh, your hand is going in a banana. Let me shoot your hand in a banana. And then let me take a step back and have you grabbing the banana and then wait a bit for a client to come and I have you selling a banana to the clients. And it's a step-by-step -step thing, but you don't want to rush it. Yeah, I really need to take her portrait and really take a boom, point and shoot, walk away. Like, this doesn't work, okay? We learn to travel in a smart way. We learn to approach people. We learn to get better picture and at the end, getting better travel experience. Okay, you get people's story, you feel people are happy when you take that picture, and at the end, you went a bit further because all the tourists were in that market, you didn't want to go there, you know, it takes more energy to photograph where tourists go because people are like, oh, no, no, uh, money, give me one dollar. So you go to the village next door where no tourists go, and then you see something more, you experience more, and then someone invites you to have lunch in a house because they don't see tourists there. And at the end, you have a much better travel experience, but it is an interaction. Okay, you're gonna take photos of people. I believe you should give them something back. And by giving them something back, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about give them an experience, give them a smile, give them a love, give them a, an interaction with the Western world. You know, I mean, a lot of people look at my hairy arms. People keep coming and touching my arms like I'm a monkey and I'm like, hey, go ahead, touch my arm. And, you know, this is the way people remember that. This is Bill, Bill is actually here. He's listening to us, yeah? So this is Bill. Bill is actually from New York. And uh, Bill is, you know, he doesn't speak a word of Vietnamese. Bill is a New Yorker living in New York. And he comes to Vietnam and he learns how to say hello and thank you. And after five minutes, he's chatting with two ladies and everyone's smiling and laughing around him. Bill can take the photo he wants after that. So it depends on your personality. Some people are very shy. Some people are very, are very struggle to go to people and say the first word. But what you have to think as well, is that the local people who see you come in a village, they are more shy than you are. Like, oh, look, a Westerner walking here. We've never seen one. They're not going to jump on you, except if they had a few shots of rice wine, they might jump on you. But usually, mostly the ladies are a little bit more shy. So if you're not the first one who come and say, Xin Chao, from far away with a big smile, people will never get to you. So you got to do the first step. You got to break the ice to say hello. And usually when I say hello to people, they invite me in because they want to touch my hairy arms. So, but I have to do the first step. This is Andy that Pete knows, yeah? Andy yeah. is also, I mean, you got these people, they're like, you know, you walk around with these tattoos, all the guys, you know, with all the fishermen. This is in, in Hue, actually, where we run the five day tour. All the fishermen who with their little like army made tattoo, they look at these colorful tattoos, they want to look at it. And Andy is like, yeah, look, look at my tattoos. That's it. After five minutes, there's 20 guys around him looking at his tattoos, and Andy can do whatever he wants with them. Like he's the friendly foreigner who lets people touch him. So he's accessible to people. So people feel, oh, I can finally interact with the Westerner. Let's go for it. And that's it. After that, you know, you show a bit of smile and then you, you hang out with them and you see a, a potential photo opportunity happen. Then you can shoot it. It's much easier. And, you know, where's the fun in traveling when you just... It's not, it's not a visit to the zoo. Okay, it's not like, hey, we're going to go to Vietnam to photograph the people of Vietnam and, and not interact with them like they're behind a cage. And like we go there, we go in the village, we sit with them, we talk with them. And at the end, you get a good photo, but you got the whole story behind the photo and you got the whole travel experience. And, you know, traveling makes you a smarter person somehow. So you gain that as well. If you, I see a lot of photographers who are like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. But they're here for the photography, purely. I mean, I travel to country, I, I travel there for photography. But if you think purely in terms of photography, you miss this human interaction part. And that's when a good photo can become a great picture with the little details and the, the extra five minutes you spend with that person. One thing though, okay, when I talk about interacting with people, it can easily turn into, oh, hello, oh, you're a beautiful lady, can I take your picture? And then people look at you and pose that it's okay to the camera. And that, that usually doesn't get a good picture. So by interacting, I don't mean a pose picture, okay? I was on the beach chatting with this man and I was asking him how long is this line and what kind of fish does he get? So he's got a line and he's got a fishing net in the ocean behind and he's slowly, slowly pulling the line and rolling it and pulling the fishing net. The sun was rising behind and I was chatting with him how long is this line. And so he was moving his thing and talking to me. Oh yeah, this is 200 meters long. And 
and he's like pulling his line. And so there was a dynamic. There was him looking down at me and him looking up and him moving back. And then the arm is here and then the arm is here. And, the arm. and I'm here talking to him like tack, tack, and one more. Oh, and, and how many fish did you get? And how many years have you been doing that? Like, tack, tack, and one more. And tack, tack, and one more. And at the end, you, you find, you know, you see it happen right in front of you. The time when his face is the right angle, the arm is in the right place, the sun is in the right place, etc. So I, I took maybe 30 photos of him there. But it's not 30 photos of him posing for me. It's 30 photos of him busy working. So it's not like you intrude in his face. You don't, I mean, you don't feel as bad as if. The most difficult photo to take is someone sitting on a chair doing nothing. Okay, there's an old lady in Hoi An sitting on a chair doing nothing. She looks at you walking in the street. You got a camera in your hands. You're going to come towards her. Uh, hello, me, photo you. Okay. Uh, what does she do? She says, hey, no, I don't want photo, get out of here. Or she says, hey, Toby, give me one dollar. Or she says, take my photo. Okay, in, in every case, it doesn't work. Um, the Q&A we had, sorry, the, the poll you had before. Okay, the people said, what do you fear when you take photos of people? And a lot of the answers was that people say no to me. Okay, I've got a trick for you, okay? Uh, if you don't want people to say no to you, don't ask them. Okay, if you, if I'm in a bad mood today and you want to take my picture and you say, can I please take your picture? Like, you know, no, get out of here, okay? If you sit next to me and you say, oh, what's going on today? You look a bit tired or oh, what have you done? Oh, you know, I'm a photographer and I do stories about tired people at work, you know? And I think you're a nice person and I think your story is interesting, you know, I'd let you take my picture. So I never ask people if I can take their picture. But I ask about them, I ask about what they do, and I have a camera in my hands. So I think it's pretty much the same thing, but you, you, you will be talking five minutes to someone and make them feel relaxed. And at the end of five minutes, say, okay, now I'm taking your picture, now get ready. Oh my God, oh my God, nice thing. Oh, is my hair looking good? Oh, is this, oh, my clothes is not the right, oh my God, he's taking my photo, let's take my, they, you know, people freeze. You lose the whole dynamic of the interaction. You lose the whole dynamic of this man working. If this man putting his net, if I would have stopped him and said, oh, can I please take your picture now? He would have stopped and freeze. And the dynamism of the action would have disappeared. So we interact with people. This gentleman uh, in a village like outside of Hoyan, I was talking to him. I, I know him really well. We see him like a couple of times a week in the fields. 85 years old, still working all day long in the fields. Amazing, man. But anyway, he was talking to me. He looks like he's posing and smiling, but he was in the middle of saying something. So you get these interesting expressions in people's faces as well. While people are busy working, you can talk to them, photograph what they do, and you have the dynamism of what they do. So they're not posing for you. That's the thing. Uh, I was chatting with this couple for maybe half an hour, chatting about the lady is fixing the net in the background. The man is like, well, not doing much. You know, it's Vietnam. Women work a little more than men. And he was coming out and he pulled the tea and he started to give me some tea and chatting about how long they'd been fishermen. And, and, and the time they all look away, talking to their neighbor, they were interacting with the neighbor. At the same time, then, you know, the light is right on both people's faces, the dynamic is right, then you're here to capture the moment. And after you capture this shot, you stay a bit longer. You know, oh, this is a nice shot, I got it. You stay a bit longer and you see how things can still evolve around. Uh, same thing, so this is in a market in, in Ninbin, in the north. And this gentleman on the right side, what I liked about him is the simple background. It was a very busy market, it was very messy, there were like, maybe cloudy, not really many interesting lights. And we were walking around, like trying to find the photo, but it was not easy. And what I liked about the man on the right side is his sunglasses, but the simple background behind him. So I thought, you know, I would come sit and chat with him. And he was selling knives. So we don't see them here, but he was selling knives. And I started start talking about if, if his knives were sharp. I mean, you don't need a, 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 a PhD degree to small talk with people, honestly. It's like, oh, is your knife sharp? Okay, you go simple with people, talk about what they sell, talk about what they do, even if you know what a, a shrimp is, ask them, you know, is, does shrimp taste good? Simple things. So anyway, and then his friend showed up, and his friend started to look at me and say, oh, there's a foreigner here, oh, I don't know, you speak some words of Vietnamese, oh, amazing. And he started switching his cigarette, and then, you know, I had no idea what to do. When I first showed up to the, the man with the sunglasses, I didn't know what to do. I thought it was an interesting spot, but it was just one man with a nice background, it was not enough. So then the interaction, the thing happened. But I was already here, I was the friendly guy. So they were really cool with me taking the picture. So this is somehow uh, the way I try to do things with people photography. It, 
takes more time and it takes more energy because when you don't speak the language, you have to go and put a lot of energy into the people like, hey, hello, hey, I'm this crazy foreigner here. Oh, it's, you know, you're moving around, you're smiling a lot. You end up after, uh, you, you cannot smile anymore. You show a hurt. But at the end, you get better pictures and you get a better travel experience. And if you come back to that same village the day after, people will be happy to see you. That's the most important thing. People will be happy to see you coming again and taking photos again because you're that friendly photographer. Now, I want to finish the presentation before the Q&A. Why Central Vietnam? So Pete explained, we're going to be running a five-day photography tour in April, which is taking us, basically, we cover the whole coast between Hoi An and Hue in Central Vietnam. This is an amazing coastline full of fishing villages, lagoons. Uh, so it's great for people and landscape photography. So the thing with Central Vietnam, Vietnam in general, I mean, I would say Southeast Asia in general is Southeast Asia is probably the easiest place on the planet to take photos of people. People are really friendly. People are really approachable uh, and people are always somehow busy working. So as I said before, it's easier for you if you want to approach someone who's busy doing something because you can ask them questions about what they're doing. So we find always activity. Vietnam is, Vietnam is the earliest country in Southeast Asia. At 4.30 in the morning, you find photography opportunities everywhere, in the markets, in the fishing villages. At 5.30 in the morning, the farmers go in the rice field to work because they don't want to work after 10 in the morning because it's bloody too hot. So you find activity all the time, sunrise, sunset, wherever you go, you will find people in the best light. Because Vietnam faces east, we have amazing sunrises. Sunsets, maybe not the best because the sun sets towards Laos and all these big mountains, jungle stuff, create some haze. So we have like maybe July, August, June, July, August, we got some pretty epic sunsets. Otherwise, it's kind of shy, but the sunrises are really amazing. And what is best than travel to a country where after a long day of taking photos, you end up with amazing food. That's what I love about Vietnam. The tour we're going to run with Pete, we're going to get lost. Like we're going to go to villages outside of Hoi An where tourists never go. And you can be in the middle of nowhere, you'll find an amazing noodle soup in every corner. You'll find a coffee, you'll find a sandwich, like proper bread, like everywhere. It's, it's really amazing. I'm already so, hungry for that. Yeah, oh yeah, you will I see. I can't wait. Gonna, yeah. We eat a lot, yeah, we eat a lot on this tour. It's, uh, it's actually, I'm gonna rename it the, the photography food tour soon, if that continues the way it is. So this is the lagoon around Hue. You can see where we shoot the sunrise. Uh, the light is pretty spectacular there. You can see the people are already busy working. The man has been spending all night fishing on that lagoon. And now he's coming back at sunrise to sell the few shrimps and fish he has. And then he's going to sleep. So we're here in the morning photographing people. People are busy working in the fields. You take photos of them. You stop them. They're happy to look at the picture. Ah, oh, they show that picture with a kid. It's really easy to go back again. Like people are really, really friendly. But I, I try to find a food photo. So here's a food photo. Okay, so that was actually, uh, that's, that's Lee in the foreground. It was on the three day tour we ran last year. And uh, we had rain on one day. So what do you do in Vietnam when you have rain? You're supposed to shoot the sunrise on the lagoon and it's raining. Well, you go to the village and you go to the indoor market and you have amazing food and you shoot people in the indoor market. That's what I love. It's always, you get people everywhere and you're very flexible. You can adapt things. When things don't work out, you always find something else. To do. This is a fishing village where we're going as well. You see the light in the morning, it's pretty great. You're facing the sunrise when you're on the sea. Pretty good. Another photo, I don't know, like chatting with people in the field. This man is working in the field. You come to him, he stops working, he wants to take a look at you, he wants to chat with you. Oh, you're a foreigner, how long you stay here? And uh, which country are uh, in your country? Do you grow peanuts? Simple things, you know, they don't know. You, they ask you, they want to know that your country, if you can interact with them at the end. You, you take a photo and you feel that they gain something as well. So everyone feels happy at the end. Okay, so thank you for this presentation. I had to make it fast, so I didn't want to put too many uh, photos or slideshows. I hope you enjoy, I hope maybe a few tips. It's a little bit difficult to uh, teach a lot of tips on a 25 minutes online presentation. Uh, Pete, I give the word back to you. Yes. All right, so uh, to finish up. Uh, we have something in the chat. 
Brandon Stanton. Yes, Brandon Stanton was the name. Surely, surely not Bruce Gilden. No? <laughs> Pretty much the opposite of Bruce Gilden. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to do a quick run through of our tour, and then after we'll open up the Q and A to ask questions about uh, photography, travel photography, whatever. Or if you have questions about the tour, you can also ask us those. Um, if you think of any questions while I'm talking, feel free to please write them in the Q and A, not the chat, and then we'll get to those as soon as we're done. So the five day Central Vietnam tour. Um, our tour dates are from April 22nd to 26th. The itinerary, uh, like Etienne said, we start in Hoi An, then go to Hue, and then return back to Hoi An. If you're wondering which airport to fly into, that would be Da Nang. It's about uh, 25 30. kilometers, 30 yeah, kilometers, uh, 15 miles or so from uh, Hoi An to Da Nang. Um, so skill level, it doesn't matter what level of photographer you are, whether you're a beginner, advanced, intermediate, um, there's something for everyone for sure. And um, if you look at some of the comments on, um, on uh, Etienne's uh, Hoi An photo tour site on um, TripAdvisor, you'll see a lot of people say, I'm a, even a professional photographer and I've joined the tour um, and I've got to see some stuff and learn some stuff too um, that I wouldn't have if I had done it on my own. Next, the group size maximum, we have uh, 10 people and the price is 1,450. What's included? Um, accommodation, all accommodation is in three and four star hotels. Also the accommodation is not shared. So you have your own room. You're not sharing your room with anybody else on the tour. So that's included in the price. Also all meals, transportation, tips to the locals, your guidance and instruction. And one little bonus, um, we're gonna add in a two hour pre-tour know your camera class. So if you show up the evening before the tour, we will sit down with you and give you a little kind of mini workshop about, you know, your camera settings, how to use your camera so that the next morning when we actually go out into the field, you're not fiddling around wondering how to use your camera. You can go in and, and get the shots that, that you want to get right off the bat. But and the tool, that, yeah, sorry, Pete, keep going. Uh, that's only for the next 48 hours. So if you make your deposit within the next 48 hours, then um, you will also get that bonus. Go and ahead, uh, the, the tools, the workshops also include uh, on the five day tour, we have two photo reviews, yeah? So we have two sessions where we sit together on the computer, uh, look at people's photos, review uh, criticism of that composition, etc. And we do also a bit of uh, Lightroom tutorial. Yes. So you'll get critical feedback on your photos, learn you know, what you need to do to improve as well. What's not included in the tour? Well, your flight to and from Vietnam is not included. Travel insurance, any souvenirs, and um, your travel visa should you need one to enter Vietnam. And your, and your alcoholic beverages. <laughs> no alcohol. Okay. But beer, I think there is not very expensive from what I Ah, it's super cheap, don't worry. And anyway, usually, usually I get the beers on the, mostly on the, on the okay. Saturday night. Yeah, we have a big yeah. dinner in Hurry on Saturday night. Usually I get the beers. Okay. Um, a couple uh, testimonials. Mark, I think he is from the UK. He said, it's my second time going on one of the tours arranged by Etienne, and I hope it won't be the last. Jackie said, fantastic opportunity to meet and photograph the local people. And if you have any questions now, go ahead and uh, okay. type your questions into the Q&A. Also, if you would like to sign up for the tour, you can go to pixavasia.com tour forward slash five day central Vietnam. I'm going to put that link um, in the comments now. So if you have any questions. We have, so yeah. we have a few already. Yeah? We have three questions okay. that came out. Yep. Uh, there's a question. There's a, there's a button under the questions. Uh, answer live. What if I click on this? Um, yeah, go for it. Ah, no, that means I'm talking to it. Okay, no. You can just say what the question is. You okay, so Carl, Carl is asking, um, how do you stay motivated and find new things to shoot around Hoi An even after being there for so long? So that is a good question. That is relevant whether you are a landscape photographer or a street photographer or a travel photographer, whether you live in New York, whether you live in Hoi An or you live in uh, Kabul, I don't know. The thing is, how do you keep being inspired? Uh, photographing the same thing. That's when really 
I think you can tell the difference between a photographer who's ready to push themselves and someone who, who, who's more easily giving up, okay? For me, personally, it's been, it's, it's every, every three years I got this big crisis. Yeah, it's been 10 years I do photography, 12 years I do photography. Every three years is like, okay, I hate everything I do. It's terrible. It's the same stuff I was shooting two years ago. Why am I still shooting the same stuff? And every time it's like, oh, I suck. Oh, I suck. I'm doing it. Go to call your friends, complain you're a terrible photographer. Blah, blah. You know, the same cycle like everyone does. I think what's important is either, so I don't have one answer for you. What helped me, uh, something that helped me a lot, well, it's not, the, it's not the right answer, but something that helped me a lot was three years ago when I, I got a new camera system. Uh, switching from DSLR to mirrorless camera with a tilt screen, uh, having a new kind of lens made me shoot a different way, made me look at things a different way. So I got a really big breath of inspiration with this new camera system. Uh, something also that I did last year was to try a new genre of photography. So I am very much into street photography these days, which is, which is a very different approach from travel photography. But that helps me to look at things a different way. And I can tell that it is not inspiring my travel photography. Uh, what else could you do? Well, trying new things. Yeah, my, my friend Jeannie in Australia, who is a great photographer, but every, every six months she's doing this portrait workshop, studio workshop. Like she, she loves to shoot landscapes in Australia. She goes to put herself in a studio and she's going to learn something out of this. And she's going to find a new breath, a new inspiration for her landscape photography. So, Another way to get inspired is to look at other people's work or to attend uh, photographer workshops. If you see a photographer who does something that you really like, if it costs you $3,000 to go with this person instead of buying a new camera, you should spend $3,000 to go with this person. It will make you a better photographer than buying a new camera. Please stop with the gear, okay? Not helping you. I hope I could answer that. Questions, Carl? Carl has another question. Can I, can I jump in there? For oh yeah, please, sorry. Uh, one thing that I do uh, if I get in shooting ruts or how do I stay motivated? I think a big thing for me is doing projects. So um, rather than just taking your camera on a weekend or Saturday afternoon and walking around and taking photos, I try to pick a theme or a, a personal project. So for example, um, if you don't want to travel, you just want to do something in your hometown or wherever you're at, uh, you could try shooting that location at, uh, in different seasons. Uh, you could also try shooting it at different times of day, or you could try shooting it with a particular lens. Just pick one lens and go out and shoot with that lens. But whatever you do, try and pick up a, a theme or uh, make your own personal project and do that project in that area. So picking some kind of project really helps. And then I would also second what Etienne said about gear. It's funny you say it's not the right answer because we say gear isn't the way, but I'll tell you, um, I was feeling at one point a little bit um, maybe in a rut or a little bit bored with uh, landscape photography at, a, at the time because I was kind of doing the same thing over and over, just like Etienne said. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. And at a certain point, you want to develop your work. It's not just about doing the same thing forever. It's about continually evolving and learning. And I bought a drone. And once I got the drone, then I was out with the drone all the time. And I, and I love taking it up. And it, and it brought my photography to a different place and allowed me to reshoot things in a different way. So I would say definitely um, either pick a theme or try using a different piece of gear. That would be one way. The, to key, the key is, as Pete just said, you have to evolve. If you are a photographer who's been successful doing this one type of photos and you think you're going to be surfing on that wave for the next 20 years, you are wrong. Okay, people are going to be fed up to see all the same stuff over and over again. You have to evolve. You are an artist, you are a photographer, you have to evolve. If your style doesn't, if your style doesn't evolve, you are stuck somewhere. And being stuck somewhere is, is never good. Any new tools planned with Pixabasia coming up? Yeah, um, well, that is a very good question. Okay, my problem is time. Uh, when I'm not running tools in Hoi An, I am running tools in other countries in Asia. And when I'm not doing that, I wanna be home with my children. So I, at the moment, do not have time to really go scout new countries. 
But I do have my eyes on a few places. I do have my eyes on the Tajikistan, if I have the time. But I'm, I might go and explore Gujarat, uh, which is a province south of India. Maybe after my photography tour in India in December, I will go to Gujarat, spend a week or two uh, exploring the place and build a photo tour there. I mean, I've heard great things about the place, how it's really, really unexplored. So we'll see, we'll see. Time is the problem. Cathy, what are the lenses you like to shoot with in the market and which one do you like for landscape? So Pete, I'm gonna reply um, for the landscape part. I'm gonna let you reply for that. For me, the market's simple. Uh, I shoot one camera, I shoot one lens. I have another lens for portraits. So I shoot uh, with a 23 millimeter lens, which is on a crop sensor equivalent to 35 millimeter. So 95, 99% of my photos you can find online are shot with a 35 millimeter. This is for me ideal for markets, for street photography. It's uh, for me, I'm thinking about maybe soon getting a little bit wider, but the wider you are, the more difficult it is though. You have to be aware. You have more things in your frame. So for me, markets 35 millimeter, uh, full frame equivalents. And if I see an interesting portrait, I will put my 35 millimeter on, so which will be equivalent to 50 millimeter. So that's all I do. Uh, if I, last year when I went to Iran, I did rent a wider angle because Iran landscapes, of course, I needed a wide angle lens, which I actually loved a lot. So I'm thinking about buying that lens. So what do you use speed for landscapes? Yeah, for me, I use, uh one lens 95% of the time. It's a 16 to 35 F4. And I'm using a full frame camera that's a Nikon uh, A7 II. So that would be the equivalent of 11 to 15, I think, on a crop sensor. Mm -hmm. um, but I use, so this is a zoom lens and I like it just, um, it allows me to uh, work more with, uh, have more flexibility. Um, when I'm in whatever situation, I can zoom in or zoom out. I love it, it's a, it's a fantastic lens. Okay, yeah, so I mean, for landscape photography, it's, it's, you have to be wider. Like to have this, this, this feeling of, of space and open space and wideness, you need to be wide, but it is more difficult to photograph people on wider lenses. Peter, next month, March, will be the third time with Etienne. I did a group of photographers from the US, they always say it's one of the highlights in Vietnam. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm looking forward to having you again in March on a, on a custom three-day tour with your group, taking you to that very special fishing village. I keep especially for you. Thank you, Peter, for that. <laughs> uh, Michelle, when you turn up in a new place, any tips for quickly finding interesting locations to shoot? So, personally, for me, going into a new place uh, is a mixture of so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go read about the place online. The, you know, Lonely Planet website. What tourists go and do stuff and what is the main thing to do? So I kind of know that somehow I'm going to avoid most of these places. Uh, then, but then, you know, you, then it's also, so this is the first approach and you know a bit about the, okay, tourists usually they go from here to here to here. So if I go here, 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 I might actually find some hotels and restaurants too you know, to sleep and eat. I'm not gonna be in the middle of the jungle. Then it's about, I, I do a lot of Instagram, uh, not, not myself, like, you know, writing comments or replying to comments stuff. I don't do much of that. Uh, but I, 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 go, I go search on Instagram photos about these places. And every time I find some interesting photos of these places, I actually get in touch with a photographer. Most of the time, it is a local photographer. And when local photographers get contacted by someone coming from another country, to say, hey, I like your photos and, you know, can, can, can we meet when I'm there and, and we can go shoot together? They love it, you know, they love it. They, they get someone to come and I can go shoot with, they can learn something, they can interact. So usually I have a lot of, I meet, I do a lot of local contacts with this. And then I usually try to, um, so every photo tour I run, I use a, a travel company on site to organize all the logistics and I find a photographer slash tour guide to, to take us around to help us interact with people and, and translate and, and you know, help on anything. Usually, this is, the, this is the key in my tours. Like, if I have the tour guide that thinks we're gonna see the touristic stuff, it's gonna take us to the wrong place. If I have the tour guide that exactly understands what we, what we want, we're not interested in going to see the temple, we're interested in going to find the remote village where people are busy working in the field at sunset. 
then it's pretty amazing. So it's a mix of doing your own research, but get help from local people there. They know the place, they, they, they grew up there. If they understand what you want, they will show you the best places, but you need to be clear with them. Like, if I read a tour guide, I can go to the temple myself. No, no, bring me to that village where no tourists go, but you know there's, there's something happening there. Pete, anything? I agree. I, I do both of those things. Um, research online, local knowledge is, is priceless. Um, but I also, uh, one tip would be to just kind of also don't underestimate your own curiosity. So find, you know, just go, just walk out your front door and go to that place that intrigues you. Because if you're excited or interested in that, that area, then your photos are going to show that you'll see that in your photos. So, um, you know, don't just go to the market because the market's where everything's happening, or don't just go to the temple because that might be the more interesting thing. Find that thing that, you know, just go for a walkabout and see what catches your interest. And that's what's going to show on your photo in the end. And when it's, when it's one, one last thing, when it's about people photography, mostly when it's about people photography, is uh, so many times, like we, we're going to see this. Okay, we are with a group, we're in a minivan, there's a village with a lot of things happening. We get to the village, yeah, it's great. When we leave the village, and this unexpected last person came back from the field when the sun was setting, we didn't expect that, that's the photo of the day. So when it's about people photography, I mean, opportunities are around the corner. Like you get out of your house, you get out of your hotel in Hoi An, there's probably a great photo to take in the corner. The, it's not about the destination. Okay, so you kind of go, I'm going into this area because the light is nice and there's people, but I have no idea what I'm gonna shoot. And you're gonna jump on every opportunity you find and you will find something if you're open to see things. Satish, a very good question. How do you manage to strike a conversation with your subject in Alien Man? Also, I feel your skin color helps a lot in street photography. I must agree with you, Satish. Uh, I, all my Vietnamese photographer friends, we arrive, we're in a market and they go take photos and people look at them like they're photographers and I go and I speak few words of Vietnamese and they go, ah, oh, you speak Vietnamese, ah, oh, come here, take a photo. Like, it helps, okay? Uh, you have a different skin color, people are more curious about you. People are more surprised when you say some words of their languages and it makes everything easier. Uh, how do you strike a conversation with your subject in an alien land? The thing is, uh, communication is not necessarily verbal. Like you can spend hours, maybe not hours, you can spend half an hour having a conversation with someone without the use of any words. It's about gesture, it's about smile, it's about trying to understand each other what he's doing here. So the conversation usually starts with a smile. It's a big smile, it's a like, oh, I am. What are you doing? Oh, is this fish you're having here? Is this rice you're growing here? Is this corn in this field? And you go and put the camera down and go and, and you know, they're, they're having a piece of wood, they're sculpting to make some kind of tool. You take it, you're like, oh, you're just so interested in the people. It's, it's all, the, every country around Asia is the same. I do the same way I do in Myanmar and the same way I do in Sri Lanka. People are the same. We are from the same planet. We work somehow the same way. Takes more time when you don't speak the language. Richard, I love your advice on taking the time to get to know your subject by showing interest in what they're doing. How often that do not, how often that not do you purchase your opportunity for uh, start tipping them for the time? So, tricky subject. Okay. Um, can you just can you just say? Oh, I'll just say the question because when in the replay, people aren't going to be able to see the question. So the uh, question okay. is basically. Um, how often than not do you purchase your opportunity to photograph them by purchasing what they may be selling or flatly tipping them for their time? And uh, just a quick note, I put the link to the um, five-day course in the chat if anybody wants to see that. And when you, if you, it is, um, we're, I want to keep true to the time. It's, we're now at one hour. I know some people have to go. We're going to continue and stay on. We still have a, a, a few more questions. Um, but if you are leaving us now, when you close your browser, you sh there should be a link to a questionnaire, a little survey about this webinar. And if you could give us your feedback, we would really appreciate it so we can help improve these in the future. But like I said, we're going to stay online here until we answer all the questions. So we're going to continue. Um, 
Etienne, take it away. Uh, flat still, tipping I, still have, I still have all this to drink, yeah? No rush. <laughs> so, okay, this is a gray area. Okay, there is no right or wrong answer. This is the kind of topic that when I wrote about it on an article saying, should you pay people for your photos and Petapixel shared it, you know, Petapixel, the website, shared it on their website. This is the only article they had to take down because of the number of negative comments that we see. So this is a topic that makes people talk, okay? I never pay for my picture. I would never give money to someone because I take the picture because I'm not a commercial photographer. So if that hotel pays me to take photo of a farmer in the field in front of the hotel, I'm being paid for that. I'm going to pay the farmer. He's my model. He's a professional model and I will direct him. I may tell him, you yeah, sit on the buffalo and I want you in that corner. This is, we're talking about travel. We're talking about candid travel photography here. Okay. I never stage my pictures because it's boring, because it's too easy because it doesn't make you improve and become a better photographer. If you approach people the right way, first, people will never ask you for money because somehow you have already given, you already gave them something back, okay? Then I buy things from people, okay? I'm in a market, there's this old lady, she doesn't seem that she's really wealthy, like a lot of people here, and she's really beautiful, and actually, we need bananas, okay? Everyone is a bit hungry, we had breakfast, but hey, I'm gonna buy some bananas from you. So I will, I will purchase things from people if they sell something, but I never, I never will take a photo of someone and say, oh, that's a great picture. Oh, here's one dollar for you. You, you. you put people into a very wrong scheme of, oh, foreigners come here, they give money for photos. Oh, there you go. Next time foreigner comes here, first thing you do, you show the hand. Say one dollar. What's going to happen to the next photographer coming there? You just destroy the whole place. So it's a bit tricky. I mean, you can also think, you can also think okay, I come here, okay, I have money, I'm from America, whatever, I have money, I can actually help the people. Do not start throwing money around, you're just destroying the place. You find an NGO in the next town who will help that village and you go give them money. They will find a smarter way to spend your money than just throwing money around and reinforce the stereotype that tourists, they throw money around. It's not helping anyone. Pete? You said it. Okay. Okay. It's, it's a tricky thing. Okay. Come on the tour. You'll see. Lee. Well, typical Lee. Beauty in the mundane. Details, texture, slowing down. And Lee is right. Lee, you can find everything. Lee was running the North Vietnam photo tour uh, with me in September. He's the one you saw in the tea plantations at the very first picture of your presentation. And, uh, and he, I mean, you know, you go around and it's raining. What do you do? Details, textures, and the same rules of composition apply. You know, so it's interesting to slow down and and, and it's the same to answer the question of how do you do, how do you keep being inspired by shooting the same place over and over again? You walk into Hoi An, okay, you've been taking 500 photos of conical hats in front of yellow wall. Time to do something else. Well, oh, actually, the yellow wall has an interesting texture. I'm going to do a, a project, like you say. Start a project for the next year. I'm going to shoot macro of Vietnamese walls. Whatever. If this is your thing. But it helps you to do something else. Cindy. Cindy, will you be repeating Bangladesh in 2020? Cindy, I will be, I believe, repeating Bangladesh until the day I die. This is... After five years of Bangladesh, it is still my favorite country to go and photograph. So I will be going again and again and again. This is not only the country where with the highest rate of good picture, because photos are everywhere, nonstop, all the time, but it's also some of the friendliest people I've ever met. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's and the food. Oh my God, the food. You're not going there to, to go on a diet, just, just so you know. Anyway, well, signing up, Cindy. I'll see you next year, I guess. Uh, Peter, Peter again. Adding, Etienne has motivated me after the first time I met him. I have been doing this since 1980 and I am still learning and even changed my camera system for Fujifilm mirrorless. Well, Peter, thank you very much for that. I know I have been the best seller for Fujifilm cameras for the last two years, even though I don't work for them. <laughs> but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, this is a great camera system. Everyone who spent a bit of time shooting with me uh, in Vietnam, travel photography, people photography, see me shooting with a, this mirrorless system. Usually they get convinced that the big DSLR is, is not really the best way to go for that. Thank you, Peter, very much. All right, I think that's uh, all the questions. If anybody- Any more questions? If anybody has another uh, question, you can uh, type it in. Um, while we're waiting for that, though, I'll just say thank you all for uh, your time and joining us. It was really fun. Uh, I'm sure Etienne as well, you had a, a great time. Yeah, very, very fun. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing all your tips and information. It was very helpful. My um, pleasure. And everybody who joined us, uh, please remember that uh, when you sign out or when we end this webinar, there should be a little pop-up screen um, of a questionnaire. It's just a five question, I think five questions. It won't take more than a couple minutes to fill out, but we'd really appreciate your feedback um, on this webinar so we could improve it in the future. Um, if you're interested in the Pix of Asia five-day Central Vietnam tour that Etienne and I are leading together in April, I put the link in the comments. Or if you're interested in any other tour that Etienne is doing, just go to pixofasia.com and find out the rest of his. Um, and remember tours. that uh, Pix of Asia is not only photography tools. We have hundreds of uh, photography tutorials on our website. So I've been writing everything I teach on a photography workshop is on the website. So you can find tons of material about approaching people, about composition, about creativity, and how do you deal with being stuck somewhere and camera settings. So take a look. Um, and before we go, just uh, I'm wondering um, what you, anybody out there, if um, you have any, just a quick feedback, did you find this uh, webinar helpful at all? If you could just write a comment in, in the, um, in the chat or whatever if you what if you found it helpful or if you enjoyed it if you'd like us to do more of these if you have any uh quick feedback for us um we'd love to hear it but um otherwise um yeah etienne do you have any closing thoughts or remarks not really i mean come come to vietnam i'll show you uh the fun of people photography of course people photography is not for everyone some people are very shy. Some people don't want to go and talk with a the subject. They're happy to spend six hours in a bush waiting for the bird to go on that branch with a long lens. It's a different type of photography, but it's a really fun and, and it's really, I could almost call it a, a travel workshop. It's, we learn photography, but we learn how to travel. We learn how to travel and have a great time traveling and come home with great pictures. All right. Thanks, uh, Susan. Uh... Uh, actually, I can't see the um, comments here. Yeah, uh, the name of the comment. Michelle? Is saying... Michelle, is that Michelle? Yeah, it's M. Yeah, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Great way to start the day. Motivated to get out and shoot. Glad you could join us, Michelle. Susan, thanks. I love following both of you on Instagram and hope to join one of your tours one day. Yes, I hope you will, Susan. John, great tips on lighting and composition as well as how to connect with people. That's great. Thanks, John. James, I like your approach and look forward to joining you in the future. We hope you can join us as well. Oh, one thing I wanted to add on the tour that Etienne and I are doing, there will also be some uh, opportunities for landscape photography. Of course. Not so. just people. And I, that's really my passion. So if you're also interested in that, I think one of the benefits of joining the tour that Etienne and I are leading together is that you're going to get a little bit of both worlds so you can kind of get a taste for each so it would be actually interesting because you're here to make it special like i go to these places you know the place we're going to photograph i go there maybe once a month and i shoot them usually on a on a, on a people travel photography workshop how about we're going to do okay this one maybe is a bit special because speed is here we're going to try to analyze the scene and see how we can landscape that scene with human elements yes it would be very interesting. i very can't wait Cool. Well, Etienne, I will see you in uh, next week in, in Vietnam. Okay. And, yeah. yeah. And you thank there. you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank, thank you, you very much for your everyone. time. And we'll see you out there. Take okay. care. Bye-bye.